Welcome to the Kayak Fishing Obsessed Podcast. We'll be sitting down with a fresh guest each week. Someone who shares the same kayak fishing passion that runs through our veins. We're talking kayak anglers, kayak companies, lure experts. Heck, anyone who's got a story to tell about landing the big ones from a kayak. We're setting our sights on becoming the number one kayak fishing podcast in the world. You'll get a chuckle, a grin, and hey, maybe even a belly laugh. Because we believe in the power of humor. But above all, we're here to educate and inspire. So, whether you're a seasoned kayak angler or just dipping your toes into this exhilarating world, join us on the Kayak Fishing Obsessed Podcast. It's time to reel in adventure, camaraderie, and the joy of the catch. Here's your host, Darren Wendell. Hey guys, welcome to podcast episode number 40 brought to you by the Wendell Fishing YouTube channel. Guys, we got Drew Gregory on tonight and we are going to be ge geeking out about some pre-fishing strategy. We're going to talk about the kayak adventure series. Pumped to hear about that because that's kind of new and I don't believe the website's even out and there's only been like one stream for that. So that's going to be awesome. And we're going to hear about what the latest is at Crescent Kayak. So I am pumped up tonight, guys. We've got some upcoming guests coming down the pike. We've got the knucklehead winners coming up next week. The bearded paddler after that. I booked impulse rods. I had an absolute freaking blast on the Alex Rudd podcast last Friday night. Had another party on Debo's Fishing and Dizzle this past Saturday night. So it's been an incredible week. And what else is awesome is my daughter, Mercy Wendell. Here, I got a photo for you for those who are not on the podcast. There she is. She just won her second tournament, right? So our church has a little church fish off. Last year, it was like 60 people. She won most fish with like 16. And then there's probably 30 anglers this past Sunday. And she won most fish with six bass. And so pretty proud of her. It's like a secret. Um, it's not really a secret. I tell my wife all the time, like, I really want my daughter to help be a part of the Wendell Fishing Channel here moving forward. But that was awesome, so I'm pumped about that. But uh, let's give it a knucklehead update here. Let me share my screen. And uh, it's coming. This might be the last time. Maybe next week might be the last time we talk about the knucklehead bass fishing series. But this is the last month. And let's see who's sitting in the top five places. We've got Ellis, Ellis McRoberts in first, 103.75 inches um, over five fish. That's like 20-inch fish for this top five. Congrats, Ellis. Tammy Sanchez, who's already on the team, which I'm excited about because she continues to put bigs on the board. 99.25 inches. Jake Tomlin, also already on the team. 94 inches. I'm coming in fourth with 93 inches. And Levi Bolgren, 89.5 inches. But keep this in mind. Ellis has signed up for a variety of other teams. So if he decides to pick a losing team and not pick Team Wendell, then that'll break it down. Levi, you could be up for winning, your last, winning the last spot on team Wendell, so pretty excited about that so we'll see what happens there but guys let's go ahead and move into the juice tonight remember this is an interactive show we want to hear your questions um but let me welcome to the show 2022 bassmaster kayak series angler of the year including three back to back to back wins won six times nationally in 22 earned the hobie angler of the year title in 2020 the director of fishing. I mean, come on, what better title is title is that at Crescent Kayaks? My man, Drew Gregory. Welcome to the show, brother. What's going on, bud? How you doing? No, I'm doing great. I am just pumped for tonight. I've been pumped to have you slated for a long time now. So I know you I've seen you on other podcasts, so forth and so on. It's like we gotta get him on KFO. And so thank you. I cannot wait, man. Let's uh, let's get into it. I, I mean, we've got a lot of folks out there I know that are listening and, and watching, and they're going to keep this this train and party rolling with some good questions. And I, I'm excited, man. I, I, I'm really pumped because, you know, here's what's cool about fishing. You know, I didn't really know a ton about, you know, you and your channel and you reached out. And it's just incredible, like this in, like whole separate population. of, And I didn't know Alex Rudd before I met him and went on his podcast. There's all these people out there with these giant – massive followings and groups of folks and incredible shows and incredible talents like yourself. And then, all, and then boom, like, it's just, you get exposed to something new and look at all that, like all your fans and all your folks. Now I get exposed to what we're doing. So it's just kind of cool that we get to team up and do something like this, bud. 
Heck yeah. Well, let's 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 talk about the thing that we might be like second to talk about this kayak adventure series. Like, hit us with what's yeah. going on there because you can't find it on the interwebs right now, right? Not really. I mean, we did one live stream about it just because, you know, people were asking questions. A lot of rumors were getting out there because we had to kind of talk about it with people at ICAST. And of course, once you talk about anything at ICAST, <laughs> forget that. Once you just talk about anything through a text of somebody that's private, it doesn't matter. Everything just is all of a sudden can easily become public, you know, so and we knew it would, of course. So once we started talking to sponsors and people there and, and I talked to the other tournament directors, we knew someone was going to talk about it with somebody and then they were going to say something to somebody. And, and that's OK. Mm -hmm. We weren't trying to keep it a big time secret or anything at that point. But uh, yeah, we did a live stream and uh, talked about it. It's on my YouTube channel and it's on Jeff Little's YouTube channel. It's on the Serious Angler channel. It's on just several channels. You guys can go check it out. Paddle and Finn, I believe. So nice. go listen to it. It's probably an hour and a half long. We talk all about it. But basically it's a new, you know, kayak fishing tournament series. It's sort of like has a festival component to it or multiple mm -hmm. festivals, really Thursday and saturday festival component to it you know think live music food trucks games bouncy houses for kids kayak demos toyota truck demos atv demos stuff like that is going on and uh it, it you know the results the coolest part really in my opinion is, is the results are going to be held in these historic theaters in these kind of quaint little small you know medium small cities we go to they have these historic theaters downtown with the marquee and all the lights so it gives all our right. real stage to be on you know, confetti's going to go off, smoke machines, they're on a real stage, and we're in the air conditioning, you know, because these events are next year, 2024, and mostly in the warmer months. You're okay. in AC, you got food to drink, you got a comfortable seat, what's not to love? And then after the awards are over, we go to an after party, there's even more partying, we're pushing each other in the bushes, 1, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., it's just having a blast. <laughs> Because our uh, awards are on Saturday, so everyone's going to be there to celebrate. And there's no reason to leave, right? So to, to leave the fun. That's kind of the gist of it. There's a lot of other cool things, different categories and ways you can win besides just the five biggest fish. But um, it's a day and a half format, a very unique day and a half, a Friday afternoon combined with a Saturday. But it's still just five fish between both. So if you don't okay. make it in the afternoon, you're not like, it's like you can't fish the tournament still. You might be down four hours. But anyway, we talk about it in the podcast and – you know, people are looking forward to it, and I know people are probably making comments about it. It's just uh, just different twist, man. Just kind of – and a two-man uh, team, by the way. I will mention that. The two-man team division. Oh, okay. A lot of buzz. I did that back with the River Bass and Tournament Trail, so that's another cool uh, concept. And then, of course, um, awards for the top youth and stuff like that, man. I could, I could go on and on. But I will mention this because I promised people a special nugget that we didn't talk about on the live stream. So people who – you know, are listening to this, we'll get the little different nugget. I didn't talk about on the live stream, the angler of the year and the team of the year. I don't believe we talked about that. It's calculated in a way that no other tournament trail has ever done it before. Okay. And I can't get into all the details now, but I can kind of loosely explain it. Basically what it is. Uh, there's a, tur a tournament trail in Alabama that my buddy uh, Lance Cooley kind of helps run. I forget mm -hmm. which, if it's the iron city kayak anglers, maybe, but there are a couple tournament series there, and he developed a new AOI points. You know, uh, I don't know how to, what the word is a points uh, accumulation or whatever, just a configuration. Someone help me out with the word I'm looking for. But anyway, he what he did is he said it just seems odd to me that if you catch, let's say, a quarter of an inch or a half an inch below the leader of the tournament, that you only you know you might get one point less or whatever it is for the AOI. But then all of a sudden, let's say there's people that are 10 inches below you two and they get just one point less and you had half an inch mm. or a quarter of an inch from that winner and they're 10 inches below or let's say like 10 people are stacked within a half an inch there's a bunch of tiebreakers or whatever and you might only be an inch let's say off of the leader but you're in 11th place and you get 11th place aoy points but you're literally just an inch off the leader i mean is right. that really like sh showing is it really indicative of the how good of a day you had on the water i mean you're only an inch behind so he came up with this standard where the leader of the tournament, whoever wins the tournament, sets a standard. That's the score, right? That's the score. That's the maximum score for the day. And everybody else gets a the number of points that's a percentage of whatever they got towards that top angler sc score. So basically what that means is, let's say two people tied at first. Let's say you got two people that are tied. Okay. Obviously, you got to break the tiebreaker by the biggest bass. But after that, for AOI points purposes, you could get the exact same number of AOI points as the winner. Or if you're in a tie for third or fourth or whatever, or you guys are all real close, you're just getting 
you know, a percentage of what you got to that standard score that the angler up top set. So basically th to sum it up the easiest way you get what you earned and what you deserved on how good your day was. You don't got to worry about these big gaps. And if you smoke the competition, like smoked them and you won by 10 inches, you deserve to have a little buffer in AOI points because you absolutely crushed everybody. Right. And that was not easy. That doesn't happen very often. So you deserve that, that cushion. It also keeps it from being tiebreakers because it, uh, it actually gets decimal points into the, calculations so you really don't end up with tiebreakers for aoi so it's pretty cool you just get well, what you earn what you deserve it sounds like you're like scoring on the curve like if you're grading yeah. on the curve the top person yes creates the baseline that. and you yeah that's a good i don't know i'm not good at here i got nuts ponds over here he's like uh the math is making my head spin yeah i'm glad someone else <laughs> is figuring it out because my brain hurts a little bit sounds like it's yeah you're trying to you're trying to credit anglers for yes better what right. they actually yeah and you don't have to worry about the math so that's the good news nuts mm. yeah you don't have to worry about the math you just get <laughs> have to know that whatever you actually caught compared to that the person who set the bar for that day whatever you got up to his you know score you're getting the the points based on that so you get what you you deserve and that's all that matters like you kind of want what you deserve it's a pretty cool uh system and so anyway we'll see uh we'll see how it works out but everyone who's been using it at the local club level absolutely loves it because you don't get in one of those situations where, man, you almost, you were right up there, but you're only an inch, inch or inch and a half off, but you're somehow all the way down in 10th or 11th or 12th place. Mm. And that those points don't really add up to what, how good of a day you had, you know? And right. so anyway, right. Well, yeah, you yeah. got some people on, on, on here liking it. Mainstream fishing who, by the way, we're talking back and forth. I'm going to be on his show here in the upcoming weeks. He's like, wow, I like that system. So, all right. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah, that's great. So as someone said, it sounds like NASCAR playoffs. Um, thanks, Low Life. <laughs> we are we are on, even though our website's not up, by the way, before we transition, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook, and I have a YouTube channel, but yeah, you, know, you guys can go follow us on there for more information about it. So well, where are these where are these located? Oh yeah, the, the events are gonna be yeah. in so we start in Georgia with one called Sholy Palooza. So we have a festival name for each one of them. <laughs> so we'll start with Sholy Palooza so you guys can catch it for Shoal Bass. It's a bucket list fish for a lot of people of course we're going to talk crescent kayaks later so we'll talk about the Sholey kayak um and you know which proceeds every sale of the Sholey of a Sholey kayak goes to the flint river keeper to help restore the in you know the habitat of for the shoal bass and protect the shoal bass and the fish and those rivers they live in um and of course we're going to have the flint river keeper there as well to raise money for them pediatric cancer at that event as well so Sholey palooza it's gonna be awesome the next one we go to uh michigan for wild whitehall it's in whitehall michigan oh, yeah. oh, lots yeah. of rivers and lakes you know up there that flow into the east side of lake michigan that are great fisheries largemouth and smallmouth that's like muskegon area right up yes there, muskegon, yeah, just yeah. just north of muskegon so you got muskegon river muskegon lake the white river the white lake you got oh yeah grand river is about as far south as we go it creates a lake, you know, going in before it goes in. They all create lakes when they, before they go into the Lake Michigan. Uh, and then up north of Whitehall, there's other lakes up there, too, that um, are, are awesome. They're a little bit smaller, but they're all in balance and the rivers that, that feed into them. So it's pretty cool. And then uh, after Whitehall, we will go to Poplar Bluff, Missouri, like uh, kind of early July. And so that'll be another fun one because Poplar Bluff is the gateway to the Ozarks, that town. So it's mm. right there where the Ozarks start. So if you think about it, we let, you know, most tournaments, you know, are this way and ours is uh, the he tournament headquarters is the center of the radius for the boundary water. You can fish, right? So we let people fish lakes and rivers. And so Poplar Bluff is the gateway to the Ozarks. So the mountains start right there. So you can either fish clear water, Ozark type, type rivers and lakes, Lake Wapapello, Clearwater Lake, duck creek conservation area lake uh or you can well duck creek's more in the mississippi floodplain or you could go south and east of the whole t city right and you're in that floodplain water for the mississippi floodplain and it's honestly it, it, we say it's missouri but it's three and a half hours from nashville it's super close for most people in the country so right we're going to the ozarks we wanted to keep this kind of centralized for year one we're going kind of out central but it's still you know, easy enough for the Ozark anglers to get to. They just got to go a little bit east and everyone else can come west, not too far, and we'll be there. It's going to be awesome, awesome. And then uh, the next one we go to is Tawanda, Pennsylvania, and that's on the border of New York and Pennsylvania. So it kind of feels like, you know, New York waters will be in bounds for that event. So you can kind of fish New York, Pennsylvania, and it's on the Susquehanna River. It's called the, uh, by the way, the, the Ozark one is called Ozarkana. That was our, our name for the festival. It's going to be Ozarkana. And then in the uh, 
the Pennsylvania one, it's going to be the Fiesta on the Susky. So it's a big party on the Susquehanna <laughs> River, which is kind of how it always is. And um, our after party, I think, is going to be at a, a taco place, too. So that was kind of play on the, the Fiesta on the Susky. So we're going to have a good time there. And we also are going to, after that, go to – by the way, that one doesn't have any have any lakes in play just because it's the Susquehanna River and mm. you know it's got multiple all the, the tributaries that flow into it are in bounds and you can all of our tournaments you can access water publicly wherever there's public access. So there's no designated launches, it just has to be a public launch. And um and then um you can portage and do stuff like that. You can wade fish. So the Susquehanna, you'll see a lot of that going on, and of course a lot of big smallmouth. And then we go to a really exciting event uh, north of Madison, Wisconsin, in a city called Sock Prairie. Okay. So that's going to be really cool because there are some giant, again, largemouth and smallmouth are going to play in that one as well. And then we, uh, and that's called the the Wisconsin River Fest. So that's called Wisconsin River, and it forms a lake called Lake Wisconsin. Who named that one? Because all the other ones are like Sholey Palooza, and and then you got the Wisconsin River Fest. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. It was, it kind of, listen, we're going to several places that have rivers, the Susquehanna river, the Wisconsin I river. It. it was kind of nice. Like we, the word fest, river fest or whatever fest, you know, like paddle fest. I know that we have a yeah. paddle fest here in Ohio and all over. We had to use something fest, at least one of these. So Wisconsin river, it was already the Wisconsin river. We're fishing. We're like, Hey, let's just put the word fest on the end of that one. And call that done. Call it done. And exactly. our championship is, uh, is, not announced yet, but it is uh, October like fourth and fifth, and it's going to be uh, called Brood Broodstock. That's the name of our championship, kind of like the Bassmaster Classic, Red Crest. Ours is called Broodstock, and we'll announce the the location for that later. It's still between two cities locations. It's very centralized in the country. I will say that it's fairly centralized. Either one of those locations, but yeah, Broodstock is kind of the play on Woodstock, you know. So. Okay. You know, I think I think you, you probably approve of that one a little bit better than approved. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, creativity approved. Check. Yes, yep. brood, brood stock it is. So we, we want people to look back and you know five ten years from now twenty years be like, dude, I was at brood stock one. It was epic. Blah blah blah. We had such a good time and we were at such and such place and caught all these fish and it was you know whatever. We ended up in the bouncy house somehow. I don't know how. They told us it was kids only. And next thing you know, it's you know 12 a.m uh, we're jumping around we got a lot of wild stuff planned for everybody so we're excited that sounds like it'd be a great time as you're mentioning all these places i'm like come on please somewhere close to me somewhere and like it's all around me i live in canton ohio right and so the where closest, are you at by the way canton, I mean, northeast ohio are you really like canton so you're near me. cleveland so you're pretty much near where i live then where are you at i'm in kent ohio. oh yeah, are we're like super, I could have just drove down there. Well, yeah, this, we should have just we, done this like side. Have to do this apart. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know I, where you were. I thought you actually were down by Crescent, which is Georgia or something no, like that. No, well, I'm from there originally. I'm from from Georgia originally. That's that may be why you, you think that. A lot of people think that because I'm from Georgia originally, and then I lived in Charlotte for ten years. I lived in South Carolina for five as well. So I went to college in Tennessee. I made the whole southeast to her so but now i'm in northeast ohio I married a sweet girl from northeast ohio and we're up I here think. now with two kids and got the the free babysitting deal going with the grandparents and the support yes. from the family so i can still get away and do the fishing yes. and, and work on stuff like this every once in a while and and now the, the kayak adventure series which which by the way i should mention now they got the family it's, it's one thing about the kayak adventure series that we love it's it's promoted and made we have events and things going on for the, the entire family yeah so i when i go and fish hardcore on something like the Bassmaster or, or hobie or kbf it's too serious and hardcore it's hard to bring the family it's like sun up to sundown practice and, and a grind and i'm sure people will take the kayak adventure series that serious as well there's sure. no doubt about it um, because when you get a bunch of people we're expecting a lot of a lot of people to be at these events two three hundred plus well you're gonna have a big payout when entry fees $150 um, uh, for an individual division. And by the way, it's 150 for team as two man team as well, but that's okay. just 75 bucks a person. So, but anyway, you can take it serious, but we have a lot of activities for the whole family. We have excursions. We have stuff on the website listed for attractions in the area. That would be sites to see or hikes to do or river tubing over here or swimming or mini golf, whatever is going on. There's things for the family. And it, when my wife and kids are at these with me, which they should be at most of them, yeah. Uh, they're going to be leading a little excursion on Saturday for the other families that are there that have kids. And, and the idea is so our, our wives, kids, families, uh, and if you don't have wives and kids yet, it, so that you can really bond with the other anglers, so the community that, 
that we all love, you know, kayak fishing for, you know, it's community, right? There's time built in in our series for you guys to hang out and it doesn't impact the fishing. That's why we actually are doing a Thursday, I mean, a Thursday opening ceremonies and a Friday starting at 3 p.m. So you, and you can't pre-fish Friday you know, morning. So it's Thursday evening. We have all that evening to hang out and there's no reason not to be out late and just spending time getting to know each other. Maybe you, you're going through something you need someone to talk to. This is your family, family, you know, kayak fishermen, we kind of are a family. So it, it's a good place for you to talk to people, open up about whatever you want in your life and develop relationships and, and, uh, and friendships because uh, yeah. no human on earth doesn't need that. So that's what that's for Thursday. And then starting late, late on, on Friday, by the way, I have seminars and stuff on Friday morning as well, seminars yeah. and stuff going on. And then Saturday is the, the party again. You don't have to get, you don't have to leave because you don't have to get to work on Sunday. It, it's only Saturday night. So stay there, celebrate, uh, you know, develop those friendships even more with your, your kids, families, whoever. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. So, you know, speaking of seminars, how I kind of found you is sometimes how I find individuals to invite on the show. Like I'll go to like, oh, um, I know there was a fishing sem uh, not fishing like a uh, convention down in Columbus. And so I go through and look at all the speakers. I'm like, hmm, who would be interesting to have on the KFO show? Oh, Drew, there we go. I'll reach out to you. Perfect. And that's how I there found you. Like, hey, can you get you come on and like talk? Because I know you've done seminars on, you know, river bassing, which mm -hmm. kind of like your thing. Sure. Um, and then we started talking a little bit. And you're like, I want let's talk about pre-fishing strategy. So this is going to be our segue and we can finish it up with some crescent yeah. guy talk at the end. Cool. But so this is, this is what my opinion, one of the things it's overlooked the most, right? Um, you kind of, a lot of people just head out to the water when you can without even really thinking or doing any strategy pre-fishing. Now as a tournament angler, it doesn't happen by accident, right? There's a lot of work that goes on in the, in the front end before you even hit the water, like days, maybe even weeks beforehand, break it down for us. Because I have found personally that I have found some of the greatest gains in my kayak fishing kind of e evolving as a kayak angler with pre-fishing strategies. But I would love to hear from you. Yeah. Walk us through what do you do? Yeah. So everyone's got their a, a little bit different approach. And I mean, for me, what, here, let me explain, first of all, what a tournament really is. If you really haven't thought about it from this big 30,000 foot view, a tournament really is about, you know, figuring a puzzle out quicker than anybody than everybody else and even mm. then you you know you can hook the fish you can figure the puzzle out you can hook them and they can get off so even then it doesn't guarantee anything but it's just about putting yourself in the best odds to succeed and generally what that means and what we're going to talk about today is it, it actually is giving yourselves the highest floor possible if that mm. makes sense the highest floor in this entire field of anglers possible because you've figured the puzzle out it's faster than anyone else. So that's what pre-fishing and even during the tournament too, of course, but at that point it's a very much the clock is ticking, but in pre-fishing, you've got a lot of time, which is, is uh, honestly, it's my favorite part of all tournament fishing. It's the pre-fishing strategy, the scouting. That's why when you said, we're going to talk pre-fishing strategies, I mean, I don't have to even like make notes. I have nothing here. No, no <laughs> notes. I'm just going to like talk because go. it's my favorite thing to do. So um, yeah. So I, obviously we only have so much time here and I do seminars and teach people about this and I'll do some more virtual seminars that, that people can, can sign up for, um, you know, later this year, probably, but it basically it's just about quick figuring it out as soon as possible. So I've developed a couple things that, that have helped me do that. So one, um, and, and what I was saying is it's my favorite part. So whenever a, a tournament schedule gets announced, like this kayak adventure series just got announced, yep. you can start looking at that water and start, doing so many things online research before you get there because honestly it's my favorite part the same way that dude this dating back to high school or whatever like you know middle school high school whatever it was you had a date you're looking forward to going out to this girl and honestly the anticipation sometimes of it is just as exciting <laughs> as the actual like you know experience right so right the event maybe it's a whatever a concert or a football game whatever you you're into so this really is my passion is the pre-fishing and this it's figuring this puzzle out and the map study that goes into it, the YouTubing, the the Googling, all of that stuff to just figure out. You never know when you're, where you're going to find a clue, a little clue somewhere that may seem insignificant that later on becomes the whole key to unlocking that puzzle a little quicker on tournament day. So what I do is I first start with, obviously, you got to know what water you're fishing, the, the boundaries. You know, let's just for for uh, ease, ease here is just just say it's a lake and you're allowed to fish the rivers and creeks that go up the lake, you know. So 
I go and, and get a, uh, you know, I I use Google Earth Pro. You might want to get mm-hmm. that desktop version. Uh, I believe Android, you can pull it on a tablet uh, as well. But Google Earth Pro is a little bit better than the Google Maps online just because you can go back and there's different tools you you can have on it. Uh, there's a, a history tool, a timeline where you can go back and see all the satellite images from all the over the years. So oh, you can look so at a body. see where like. The lily pads come and go over the years and yeah and you, exactly generally not always but generally you are i am gonna do my map study with that satellite image that is the the lowest water level possible okay. of rivers and creeks and that's just going to expose all the underwater boulders mm. and rocks and stumps and and anything that's unique and different under the water a little drop-offs things like that um there are other times you, you might want to change that but anyway that's what i'm i'm doing but what you want to do is just go around the entire lake right the entire lake and up all the rivers and creeks that are connected they're in bounds and start dropping pins on spots that look interesting or even particular like a, a random boulder out in the middle of the lake or somewhere that you saw at low water anything that just looks unique like you said weeds lily pads anything that looks unique now here's what's crazy you're probably thinking you guys listening here uh watching are probably thinking to yourself well if i did that I'm probably going to be just dropping tons of, of pins all over the place, like constantly. Cause you're always seeing something that looks fishy, right? Right. Well, yeah, at first you are, but the more, but what you got to do is once I, once you go around the whole thing, then, and you do that, then wait a day or wait a week or whatever, however long. And then I want you to go back around again. And now you and start pulling away pins and here's why, and here's how, now you know what's truly unique and different in that fishery, right? Because when you first mm. do it, when you first get to a set of lily pads, you're like, oh, wow, lily pads. Well, the whole lake could be lily pads. <laughs> and at that point, when you've gone around it, you've dropped pins everywhere. You're like, eh, lily pads are not that special on this lake. They're not that different. And bass like to live and be in places that are a little bit uh, – your bigger bass. Let's say – let's let me put it that way. Your alphas, the ones you want to catch in a tournament, mm. are going to be no different than humans. So, I mean – Let's face it, we're not raking in the money in this kayak fishing industry, right? We work in it. We what? live, you know, we're not raking it in. So we probably don't live in the biggest mansion on the biggest point on a, a lake or, you know, La Jolla, California, wherever. We're not like, you know, we don't have some prime piece of real estate. And, but those people have, for you know, worked their way up or whatever they got the money. Let's just, but you get what I'm saying. Like yeah. the alpha fish are going to push out and they're going to, you know, get the best spot for ambushing their prey mm-hmm. for hiding, for living right deep water, close by whatever they, they like need the right current kind of pushing. And to be able to really start pulling away the, some pins, you've got to go around the whole lake and drop a bunch of pins and then, then pull some back because you can never, right. Cause eventually these, these waypoints, these pins you're dropping are going to be places you want to check out during your pre-fishing. Right. You're never going to be able to hit all these pins. Now, and the better you get at, And the more fishing you do and and pre-fishing and just fishing in general, the more you're going to learn, you know, what, what is special and what's not. So you're going to be able to, to drop less pins and then you're going to be able to go back around and pull away. Now there's fewer pins to pull away Mm -hmm. and really actually during your pre-fishing time, you know, a few days you got practice one, two, three days or no days, you're going to be able to really hone in on, you know, the spots you really feel are, are the key. And I do it multiple times and I go back again and again, like multiple times, keep, keep doing that. You can also use uh, your Navionics and things like that, that are under underwater, like, you know, obviously uh, topo kind of maps yeah. for the underwater. It, you know, if you're more of an offshore angler, you're looking for the humps, you're looking for the Creek channels, like an outside Creek channel bend or something, you know, cause Hey, you know, I'm a river and Creek guy and in lakes, they still like to, associate with that original river and creek so right it's a good good place to check out so that's but really kind of, quick is yeah. that is that a paid service the google pro do you have to like pay for that it's free no that's free oh, okay you just yeah. got downloaded on your desktop you download it yeah so that's that's one key um the other thing you, you got to do is and another thing to note is when you're doing this guys you um don't be concerned about where you're too much about where you're designated launches are where you're able to launch your kayak at that event just find the best where the fit where the best spots are don't even worry about any how, how you're going to get there i mean 
I don't think there's any scenario where there's a 20 mile paddle to a spot. Most, you know, kayak fishing tournaments, you're going to have a, usually a chance to get there to that spot in the lake in a day. If it's far away, if you end up seeing a spot that looks great, you want to check it out. Um, and if there are designated launches, don't, don't forget in pre-fishing, there are not designated launches. So don't waste your time launching from a designated launch and going all the way over there, launch at the closest place possible to just figure that, that out, that area out, if it's got any, you know, potential or not, and then get out. Um, you do not need to spend a lot of people spend a lot of time, uh, in their pre-fishing in an area. Once they've even, you know, they've caught some fish and it was a spot you'd kind of figured out they they keep fishing keep fishing that same area all day long and if they do that then if you let's say you have two days to pre-fish well you've only gotten to two pins on your map and my goal is to cover and get to as many of those as possible because once you're there in person you really will also see uh you know which areas look the fishiest feel the fishiest based on so many things i like to see like in in bass boat worlds um uh, the bass, like the elite series pros and the major league fishing pros, they, they really like to, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of them obviously know those lakes. They've been there before, but if they've never been to a lake, right. they like to cruise the whole thing. They want to see the whole thing in their, mm. in their practice days, right? They got three days. They might launch from three different ramps, you know, upper lake, mid lake and lower lake. They want to see it all. Cause how do you know what's good? Like, how do you know it's the right home for you to buy? If the first home, the realtor shows you, it's probably going to be, you know, it's in your price range. It's probably gonna be an awesome looking home. Yeah, but then, the upgrade. yeah, right. And then you, you see 10 more and then all of a sudden you're like, Whoa, that first home we looked at seemed awesome when that's all we looked at. But once we saw 10, that's number seven on our list. Mm. So that's why you want to hit a lot of them because once you start learning what bass need, what they like, the things to look for, you know, birds, bait fish, flickering, the right, uh, the right clarity that, that, you know, suits, suits your ability to fool bass and that the bass would prefer, you know, not too, mm not too stained, not too clear. You might want clear because that could be your strategy. But for me, I'm a power fish and I want a right amount of stain and current because I fish rivers and creeks. So yeah. you're going around the whole lake, all up all the rivers and creeks. You're looking for the things that are going to give you all these clues. You know, if you see heron on the shoreline and they're just, or any, any fish eating birds, just any loons diving everywhere, you know, there's bait in the area, things like that. Uh, and if you're more of a electronics lake angler, yeah, you're going to, you want to, you know, graph like crazy in the areas that, that look good. And you don't have to catch all the fish in that area because I've seen it, you know, people are like, Oh, I caught 90, 90 something inches pre-fishing. And, and I'm thinking, <laughs> how in the world did you know what, how many, what you, what you caught? Because I'm never catching five out of one area. I mean, maybe they went mm. to multiple areas. I mean, if I, if I catch 80 or 90 or whatever, hundred inches pre-fishing, it's because I went to probably three or four different areas and added up my totals from, those different creeks and rivers that are all, you know, inbounds water. I'm never catching 90 inches out of like one area. If I, if I catch a 17, 18 inch fish, a solid fish for most parts of the country. Yeah. I'm out. You're gone. Yeah. I'm you're bolted. Gone. I'll see, see you in a couple of days, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what did we say right at the very beginning? It's all about, this is all a time, you know, it's a, it's a time crunch. It's all about just maximizing time and figuring the puzzle out faster than anyone else. Because, even though 17, 17 and 18s, at very worst, you know you've got it, – they're not alone. The fact that that yeah, fish was there wasn't a coincidence. Now, every once in a while, like I mean like one out of every, I don't know, 50 or 100 tournaments or whatever, I might have a, a, a total fish that just fooled me. Like I got one good one and I left and I went back on tournament day and I just can't find anything yep. around there. But generally, huh. they're there for a reason and they're not alone. You know, bass yep. don't – they, they, they don't live alone. You're, there's more bass around in that area. So like, like the saying goes 90% of the fish run 10% of the water. And it's, it's, it's pretty true. Yeah. So, so, real, so yeah. quick question before we get too far deep into this, when you were saying, like, or what's, let's say you, you, you locate a lake, you got the topo map, how much time are you spending going like section to section and then doing it again? And like, how many hours would you say? prior now granted I mean, the variables how big the lake is true but give much, us the concept give us some some i mean here. i'd say an, enough time my wife never has to worry about what i'm doing on the computer phone <laughs> she's like oh he's over there looking at maps again <laughs> um so a ton of time uh but I, I don't really know i just enjoy it and after i go because here's the thing when i go around it and i find all the stuff then 
I get even, this is where tournament fishing just gets even crazier. Then I think, well, I found all that pretty easy. So if right. I found it pretty easy, everybody else did. So if everyone else found it easy, now I got to go and search even harder and find out well, what's something that doesn't seem as obvious. And now I lean towards areas of the lakes and the rivers that don't seem as obvious because I don't want the, the to be around you know, the majority of the pressure, not just on the tournament day, but what probably got pressured hard pre-fishing. I right. would rather have, you know, a winning spot could easily be a spot that's a, a B level spot. It's not an A spot. It's not the best spot on the lake, but because the pressure wasn't hit so hard, you know, it, it's like a secret little B spot, you know, that it wasn't as easy to find. It's got really good fish, but it turns into the winning spot when everybody else splits up the fish at a, all these other a a spots these obvious places yeah but if you're going to go to an obvious a spot i'll give you a little tip here we're talking pre-fishing we're talking you know what, what you're going to do in the tournament a little bit as well but go there first if you're going to go to an a spot go there right off the bat be the first one there get what you can because you know it's going to get hit later steal what you can out of that spot get it on the board throw it back and then load your kite back up and move to another spot that you feel you may have all yourself that's not as obvious if that makes yeah. sense it it does. I was just listening to um, one of the members on my knucklehead team, Tammy Sanchez. She was re re retelling her story in her tournament. She's like, "Hey, I went to the spot that I prefished, only to find out there were four other kayak anglers there, and basically it got fished out. <laughs> she got a few mm -hmm. dinks out of what was a sweet spot. Now she didn't share whether or not it was the first one she went to. Maybe she came in later today, but nonetheless, she wasn't the only one there, and they were the the spot was already picked apart." Yep, exactly. Um, and there's some questions over here too. We could, yeah, let's go to this one. Zach, I see Zach. Yeah, he's got yeah. a good question. Zach How much Val uh, Valing, yeah. uh, sorry, Zach, I'm gonna go with Zach because your last name I'm gonna butcher my boss. Uh, <laughs> there you go. How much stain is too much stain? Yeah, for me, again, this is very, very much predicated on your style of fishing. For me, I, I want like it also just depends on this, the lake in general. So some lakes are muddy in nature and some lakes are clear, super clear in nature. So if it's a muddy lake, I want to find some clearer water to give it a, you know, if the, let's just say the most of the lake is only, you know, a, a foot visibility, there was a big rain or whatever. I want to try to find clear water where, you know, I can find two foot of visibility, you know, double that somewhere else. Right. If I can. And then, cause your fish are going to be a little bit, you know, able to see a little bit further there and whatnot. And then if it's a clear water lake, I'm usually up in, you know, rivers and creeks, which typically have a little bit more stain. But, uh, I mean, I want to find that that stain. If it's super clear and you can see four or five feet, then I want to find water that where you can only see, you know, again, two or three feet. You know, just a little bit less than the rest of the lake. And that gives me a chance for my style being a power fisherman, a better odds for a spinnerbait or a buzzbait or a chatterbait, mm -hmm. things like that. A swim bait. It just it breaks it up. And then if I'm not, if I'm not going to find the right stain, I'm going to find it artificially on the lake so you know in a river or creek i'm going to find it artificially somewhere with wind and waves on you know the windiest part of you know the windiest shoreline of the lake which is going to crash waves and then of course sometimes boats come and make wakes too but i'm going to try to find it artificially when it gets stirred up at you know by the time 10 11 a.m hits and wind picks up usually and can create my own turbulence and wind in the waves creates a little bit more of a um you know just you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It just hides the presentation and it just chops it up a little bit. Your bait gets, you know, a little bit chopped up in that, in that current and the wind, wind current. So they can't see, you know, the see it as well. And they're more ambushing and, and feet, you know, good. It's good time for swim bait, spinner bait, chatter bait yep. when you got wind, stuff like that. So, so what if you're forced to fish very clear water? You just can't find it yeah. manufactured or <laughs> it, it's yeah, just, I mean, that's a great. Clear. This is actually a really good question because it's a tricky one for me and my style. Because if, yeah. if it's all clear and, they, and I fish tournaments that are like this, yeah. then I want to, okay, A, I want to find as much current as I can. Because again, <laughs> at least the waves are going to chop it up or as much wind. But this is this is kind of predicated on the time of year. And most of our tournaments are, are in times of the year where top water works pretty well. But I'll tell you, that's my secret. If it's super clear water, I stick to top water so I can still use my straight braided line you know um or i burn the bait faster if it's a spinner bait or a chatter bait that goes under it's still kind of a top water because i'm burning it and it's on the top of the surface so i'm full and fish 
and making them choose and forcing them to react on baits, you know, like that. So that's kind of okay. what my go-to is when I, that, or you got to find vegetation again, that again, it kind of hides your, you know, my 30 pound straight braid, which is what I love to just throw, you know, a Sunline SX1 straight braid on, on everything when I can, just cause your hookup ratio is better. We're in a kayak, so there's no stretch. And, um, I mean, believe it or not, you, you can catch them on the, in pretty darn clear water. Um, if you find the right, the right fish in the right situations, even with straight braid, I mean, crystal clear water on the Susquehanna last year, I was catching them on, on a jig on the bottom, um, Z-Man cross size power finesse jig. Okay. I, I wish I would have had a spinning rod with me, but I didn't in my Sholey. I should have had it in my little, uh, locker in the, in the front of the, the Sholey kayak, but I, I didn't have any spinning stuff on me. I was stubborn and I, I thought I knew what was going to happen. And uh, I just found a school of fish that were suspended and it was crystal, crystal low, no wind whatsoever. And I'm like, oh my goodness, they're not going to eat this, but they still, they still they ate it. it. Yeah, they munched awesome. it. It was not easy. But anyway, yeah, clear water, top water is the way to go if you can, if it's the time of year where the water's warm enough. Yeah. All right, I got some comments over here. Thank you, What by the way. You're giving it. <laughs> Giving us the juice, folks, not just great for tournaments, but just great for your local yeah. lake and how you fish. So, Cruz Garza. Hey, what's up, everyone? New here in chat. Welcome what's up, Cruz? to the podcast, brother. Um, got a couple of questions here. One from Zach. He asks, how are you anchoring? Drift sock, anchor wizard, what's your style? Yeah, I mean, if I'm going to anchor, it's it, through something like an anchor wizard. That's a little bit easier for me just to crank it up. Um, there's a few different types of anchor wizard products i believe out there you can you can check but that's pretty much what i use i don't really use i mean when you have a motor that kind of these days it solves it you know especially um if you've got spot lock on the motor but mm -hmm. i do run a torquedo these days and it's just great for the river creek style that i you know fish and it's 1103 it's awesome so i don't really need to anchor a lot but if i was going to anchor then yeah it's going to be that uh, uh anchor wizard probably right on with a then, drag chain, like a piece of logging chain off the back of that sholey. Oh, there so, you go. Yeah, and it works nice. like an anchor if you want it to. And you, I, sometimes I run off the front too, but but rarely. The front's more if you're fishing upstream in a river, you know, or creek, right. and then you can hold your position. But again, if I'm fishing upstream, that's when the torpedo is, you know, it's working its best going upstream, honestly. So it'll hold me in place. Solid. Awesome. Low life anger angler has a question for you, Drew. Do you lock onto a waypoint or play the current to cover more water territory? Uh, I'm kind of almost confused by his question there. Um, is it more like, oh, I, I see you say, do I lock, lock onto an know. area? Do do I lock onto an area and stay kind of like zoned in and fish in the area, or ride the current, you know, downstream and just try to cover a lot of water? Maybe saying like that, which I think that's what he's saying. Uh, you can clear that up if, if I'm wrong, uh, low life angler, but I, I will say I cover more water. I'm a, I'm a covering water kind of guy. I cover just 15, 20 miles sometimes in tournaments. I mean, just long, long expanses, expanses potentially of water because I'm going to specific things that I've found that I know there are, I would rather spend, you know, more of my time there and, and, you know, waste, not really, it's not a waste, but waste time so to speak getting there and spend more of my time there at those locations that i've already pre-fished i've already you know i pre-found mm -hmm. right scouting on my google earth thing we talked about earlier and then went there in person during the tournament caught some fish that that told me that they were there and then and i fish a lot of two-day tournaments too that's why i do just a teeny bit of sampling on the fishing side of things because i need fish to last for two days i need to have an a b c d e and f like sort of places i can go and yeah. if I don't see that many places, you know, I'm pre-fishing that I'm never going to have them. Uh, worst case, you just have to go pre-fish practice in the tournament. But anyway, I do like to cover a lot of water and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of miles with the torpedo if I'm using that. Or if I'm not, I'm just paddling, doing a float trip from point A to point B, let's say, if you set up a shuttle in a tournament. Yep. I like to cover a lot of water, but I'm still, I got fished rivers and creeks long enough. And... I just kind of know where the high percentage areas for big fish are. And I'm very, very like disciplined. This is the hardest thing. If I can say one thing tonight is once you understand and you start to learn where those big fish live in rivers and creeks, mm. you have to be disciplined to paddle to them. Even though the current will gently take you. Like if you're just doing a fun float trip, right on a Saturday, you yeah. don't think about paddling your butt off to the next 
potential spot where big fish is because you're just floating down having fun catching 12 14 inches but in a tournament again it's like all about time it's time, time management, management. And right so you've got to do it and then you know the worst case you run out of spots and you go to some spots that you had pinned uh you know on your map that you didn't get a chance to check out during practice but but at least you're going to all the high percentage stuff and hitting those first and foremost because you know we're trying to trying to win the tournament here and, and you can just do your fun you know relaxing trip on a saturday <laughs> without the tournament but right oh we got all kinds of questions over here so let me hop over here real fast all right a couple uh comments cooler lit ap i use uh spot lock which is solid i think he runs a old town um autopilot so not sure but I think so i think we've had that conversation before um lost and tackle said hey i wish darren had you on before the knucklehead tournament <laughs> so <laughs> lost and tackle has been i know right has been trying to he's just on the cusp like every single time just a couple inches short of winning that spot but putting in the work he did say drift towards your waypoint question mark so maybe uh yeah i mean it, your waypoint, it's you just need to be able to approach it and cast at it. It depends on what it is. I mean, if it's an undercut bank, you want to be parallel in the, the bank. If it's a log that's, you know, 90 degrees out in the lake, you want to try to parallel that structure wherever you can for, you know, keeping your bait in the strike zone as long as possible um, and forcing those fish to ambush and react. You always want to imagine they're behind that boulder, behind that, you know, under those undercut roots or whatever it is, right? So, I mean – drift towards your waypoint really you just want to position your boat paddle drift whatever you want to call it motor to where your bait is you know getting as close to that piece of structure because i'm a very visual angler with the way i fish again again totally on the way i'm fishing uh, yeah. most all my fish are caught in shallow water six foot or less and they're caught on most of them are like th two or three feet or less and they're caught uh, off of a piece of structure i can vis visually see with my eyes yep. most of them so, again, you want to run that bait as close as you can to that piece of structure. So it that's why they're there is for something to come right by that rock or boulder or stump, root ball, and they ambush it. So that's the key, just keeping that bait as close to that stuff as possible. And that requires proper boat positioning. Go back and watch one of my YouTube videos or that I um I did. It's one, what was it, One Fish Many Lessons. I did, I've done a few mm. of them. I'll do more. And I, I talk and I teach about how to get your boat, in, you know, your kayak into position with a draw stroke, something that a motor can't do. So you still yeah. need your paddle sometimes to be able to pull your boat directly sideways to make sure your kayak is in the best spot for a parallel yeah. in your structure. And Drew's been posting videos for the last 14 years on YouTube. So there's quite the, uh, the deep inventory there. So you can go check that out. I've got a couple. I love this question here. It comes from agent Win outdoors. Uh, they asked the question, how do you know when to leave an area? versus staying this is like key i would imagine a tournament yeah. fishing but a way Shoot. you can burn a lot of time just fun fishing you're like holy crap i was here for an hour and I haven't caught anything like do you have any rules yeah. that you live by yeah i mean it's definitely you know dependent a little bit on how many other areas you have to go to you know potentially so if you're like i'm never going to hit all my good spots in in this tournament then you know after you've worked that area once it didn't work out you might just bail and just keep going to your others but if you don't have as many of those and it's it's a pretty big area and you did okay practice there then you know they're there you just kind of you maybe have to go and work around it again you know spend a little bit longer there it's it's that's one of the coolest things about uh tournaments honestly it's a good question because it's that's the decision that generally makes makes it or breaks it for every mm. winner of a tournament it's deciding when to leave or when to stay how long to stay how many fish are there because you just don't know i mean even with live scope which i, I don't use it but um you know, or any electronics, but you know, maybe with live scope, maybe, you know, how many are there these days? Cause you can kind of see them, but if you don't have that, that's, that's the biggest, you know, decision you'll have all day long. And it's, it's just challenging. It, it really comes down to you sampled it during pre-fishing, right? So you didn't catch right. a lot. So when you get there in tournament day, it, you should be getting, you should get into some fish pretty quick and, and, you know, not waste too much time, you know, hour or two, if it, nothing's happening in a couple hours, and you've got other places to go to, I would be out of there, you know, especially if you caught some there uh, pre-fishing, something is wrong. They're different. You got to relocate them. You may want to at least try to expand because they may have moved a little bit outside of that main zone and area that yeah. you caught them in pre-fishing, but it's, that one's just more of a 
experience on the water and experience with what's going on. I mean, have you ever come places... across, I'm sorry. Have you ever come across someone that has like rules to live by that may be a little different than that? Like, Hey, I set timers. I do this. I do that. What are some things some, you've heard over the years? Yeah. Some people uh, do set like, and I'll do this. I'll even set a time. If, if I know I, I need to get out, uh, you know, either, either make a long motor run or a long paddle or whatever pedal, whatever you're doing across the lake or to a different part of the river or whatever, or I have to load ball, like load my kayak back up and then go to another spot. Then I definitely have, uh, sometimes I will set a timer. Like I know this, you know, how big the area area you're going to is, you know, how, you know, if it's just uh, whatever, let's say a few docks or a, a pipe that's flowing some water out or a, a dam, like a spillway dam or something you, that you kind of know, you kind of know how long it takes to kind of fully fish it. Right. Or let's mm. say it's a little, oxbow kind of pond that that water kind of flows into a little opening you can get in there and it's a little two three acre little basically pond section of the lake or something if it's somewhere that you know how long it takes to kind of at least make a cast and cover all the the you know high percentage areas then you'll set a timer on like hey i need to have an hour there which means that it takes me 30 minutes from where i am here to get there you kind of figure all this out this puzzle yep. the night before so you can almost set a timer, you know, what time it is, you know, it goes off and you're like, all right, I got to make a decision right now. If I'm going to that spot and going to end my day there, I need to go now, which brings up another really good part of pre-fishing. Uh, and I think I answered that question, but is you, you always want to start most tournaments, let you get on the water, you know, 30 minutes before or 15 mm -hmm. minutes before lines in. And, and even if, if they don't, then disregard, but you always want to start at your farthest away potentially farthest away location pedal paddle motor to you know to some area that's farthest away either first or end your day there does that make sense like you don't want to kind of yeah. because then you can use that 30 minutes at the beginning of the day and it's not wasted you can get there let's say it's a it's an area that's two or three miles away and you can get there by lines in time so mm -hmm. you didn't burn up 30 minutes there and 30 minutes back in the middle of the day you only burn it up on the one way there and yeah you got to burn it on the way back but at least it's just one way, not a whole hour spent just traveling. Right. And then on the, on the flip side, another area that's super far away and you don't want to go back in line during the tournament time, do it at your very last spot of the day and just die there. You know what I mean? In there just cause you know, it's, it's got the potential and you, you know, you don't, you're, you just have no time to go 30 minutes there and 30 minutes back again during tournament hours. So that's yeah. another little, little tip there i mean you're bringing you're bringing the juice 100 percent. so i got a couple of questions here one from tatum Wool, woolridge woodridge woolridge looking at starting my kayak tournament fishing next spring any other than obvious gear that you should would suggest getting in the off season so i don't embarrass myself on day one and this is followed up yes. by a low life angler saying tether down your measure catch board it sounds like he's yes. learned a, he's learned a lesson <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it um so Tethering the catchboard is good. Uh, you know, in the Crescent Strolly, which I'm sure we'll touch on here in a little, little bit, I made a recess in that kayak. So it doesn't really, it just stays in there. It doesn't fly out. It doesn't really go anywhere. So that's, you don't have to like move it, you know, grab it from behind you or anything. So that's kind of nice. That's, that'll solve that problem for you right there. She'll yep. get a Strolly and you're good. And then, but the other question that I will say a couple, you know, at least one or two sneaky things. One is go get yourself a quad lock case quad lock is uh it's my iphone case and there's a ring that goes in here and it spins in and i've got a, a life jacket that i wear that has a, a tether and that ring is on that tether and it goes right in there yep. and you can't drop or lose your phone that's one and the other cool part about quad lock is it's got um mounts like i connect you can connect them just like a gopro mount and it can just go right on your you know for when, when you're using your phone to navigate or to find you know stuff on satellite images on your in your kayak you can put it on that i wish i had the adapter here but it could just go right on your, you know, kayak. And I use it in my truck all the time and I just navigate with it. So it just goes from off my quad lock tether into my truck or onto my kayak where I need it to be able to see visually where I'm going. It's just, and it, and it can't come out of that the way that quad lock secures in there. It can't come out. So nice. I would get that for sure. It's, it's not expensive and whatnot. So, and I'm not sponsored by them or anything. It's just somebody that uh, I've always loved and, uh, you know, always use and it's worked great. So that's one. Um, another thing, what would be, I'm trying to think of something else that's not obvious. I would say like my yak attack. Um, oh, it's the retractor they make. 
is a, is a really good little tip for keeping pliers or scissors, things that you're going to need handy on that retractor on the gear track. I love that little, mm. little thing. I use it all the time. Um, and polarized glasses, you know, I'm, I use Smith optics it, again, maybe that's too obvious, but I'm looking at visual targets. Like I said, most of my fish, I see the structure they come off of. So yeah. a good pair of polarized glasses like Smith optics can help you see things under the water that another, you know, pair of glasses, especially one that's not polarized, you know, you can't see. So if you can throw a structure that other people can't see that you could see, or you can see the fish themselves, the sight fish, that's, that's huge. I mean, a good pair of polarized glasses. I mean, I've driven back, I mean, all the way back. I mean, I'm 20, 30 <laughs> minutes away because I for, forgot them before. I just can't get on the water without them. So I, I'll no. probably think of another good one um, at some point too. That's it's a smart something that I bring, but those are some for now. Yeah. So we got Darren uh, Craddock saying, appreciate the podcast. Working on my kayak right now. So thank you for sharing all the info. I love that. I just love that there's guys and girls out there literally yeah. just tooling on their kayak as we speak. I love doing that myself. And so it's almost like nostalgic when someone says they're doing it whenever we're talking. So that's freaking cool. awesome. Thank you, Darren. That's awesome, man. Great name, by the way. So, and Tatum says, Hey, thank you all for the answers. When well, you thank Drew for the answers, I'm just asking the questions. So, <laughs> um, bring in the juice. So, we are coming up to an hour. Can you believe that? So, if you got any like last, like final call questions for Drew, I want to give a little time to talk about what is happening over at Crescent Kayaks. And so, I'm going to share my screen. Because you haven't been to their website, by the way, tip my hat to her mix that made that website. It is like the most aesthetically appealing website yeah. I've seen at like a kayak company. I don't know, it's just something it's so very clean and clean to it. And I personally, that's that's my style. So let's head over here real fast, check it out, and boom, there we go. All right, so this is kind of like your lineup, right? Right. Um, so and you guys just launched which if you've been around or, or follow a lot of the latest and greatest fishing kayaks, the Sholey, your first in your specialized fishing, but kind of what, if you had the opportunity, which you do to talk about one of these or a couple of these to this particular audience, what would sure. you start talking about? Well, I mean, you know, got to start with the Sholey since that's the, in the first one that I uh, designed with Crescent, but we're going to talk about others as well because the whole line is is great, especially if you're into you know USA made you know paddling kayaks, you know that are also super affordable for a USA made quality product. I mean, you cannot find a tougher plastic than the Aqua Tough plastic we use, and it's it's the toughest plastic there is. It's like tested, proven, so quality product. But yeah, the Sholey here is you're scrolling down. You've got all these features that are kind of just you can tell an angler thought about them. Somebody that actually is on the water a lot thought about it, you know, and put, put the designs in it. So you can even scroll, you can stop right there if you want, go up yeah. just a tad. You just tell me where to stop. You and can go you up a teeny bit right there. You got a, a spot for your iPhone for uh, live streaming or a selfie. You've got mm. those grooves there that are rod stagers. And on the top right um, there, you've got under the seat, you've got rod staging grooves, those little channels right there. You have little teeny U shapes, then they will simply, Hold your, your rods in place, especially if you're going through rapids and things like that, where, you know, the Sholey loves to, ex you know, and excels in, in moving water for sure. So little small things like that. It's not a lot. It's just a little dip in the plastic, but you have to be, and there's that catch board recess as well. Which is brilliant, by the way. I was watching, yes, thanks, man. who was the guy who did the, the walkthrough video with you, who seems super uh, James. knowledgeable. He's the yeah. owner. Yes. And that's oh, part okay. of the reason why the. Yeah, there he is. This the website so clean and neat. Like he's very meticulous on the branding, the style, and what what we do at Crescent, and just the whole vibe and culture of the brand. And what you see on that website, what you see on social media, all that it's kind of like, you know, his brainchild, his baby, and he's he's kept it that way, and he's you know not really going to ever let it go anywhere else. And like you said, I agree. Let's keep it clean. Let's keep it simple. Let's keep it neat. Um, it's just a better shopping experience and, and understanding experience when it's like that. If you go all the way down, uh, you were in a picture that showed the front strap. And that's something I would say, even to answer the, the gentleman's question. Um, Tell me where to start. Earlier, go. It, uh, there was a cam, the cam strap. Up a little thing. bit. There was a, oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, it's that handle there, but there's a picture closer up somewhere. You'll see it uh, going down, I believe. Am I going the right way? Down, no, the other way. Sorry. But you'll, you'll see it. But anyway, it's the front handle uh, strap 
I don't know where it is, but anyway, I'll you'll, find you'll it. You find keep it. talking. I'll but find anyway, it. it's the front handle strap, and it's um, you know, just to help you. There it is. Tow your. It's actually a cam strap that's seven foot long, so it it can tow your. You can loosen it all up to seven feet. You can tow your kayak to and from the water. You can, uh, you know, I even use it sometimes to just give it extra securing strap to the back of my truck. Uh, mm. You know, you can do that if you want. It's not really made for that, but you can certainly do it. The, um, you can use it as a stand assist handle. You can throw it over your okay. shoulder. There's, there's so many things you can do with it. You can use it as your wading belt. So in tournaments that allow us to wade and fish, I loosen it up and I just, I just put it through a, um, like a big loop and just put it through my belt loop and then secure it. And then you just walk and then, you know, that's it. I mean, you just walk forward and, and just start fishing and then you just have a floating tackle box behind you. So it's a really cool thing. So if you do not have a strap like that, I mean, obviously you, you can still, you can even get those. If you have another brand kayak, you can buy the Crescent handle strap on our website and the accessories area, but it's a really cool thing to have some sort of cam strap that helps you in so many ways. Uh, it's one of my favorite features uh, about the boat and those little mini cam straps you can see, see there in the picture next to it. Yeah. Those on the tank. Well, yeah, no critical. bungee. Yeah, no bungee. So you can secure things down as tight as you want. They're not going anywhere. So when you have a, a, a Yak Attack black pack in the back, which is another thing that, again, that, that guy who asked the question said something that's not obvious. I think a, a Yak Attack black pack is obvious, but maybe mm -hmm. that's just because I'm in the industry. Maybe it's not obvious, but you need a crate. And the best one out there is the black pack from Yak Attack. So in each corner of that black pack, it's got a little, uh, a little slot where our cam strap can go right through there and secure it down. Mm. And it's going nowhere. So if you do flip, worst case scenario, you know, scenario happens and you do end up flipping over. No big deal. Your stuff's going to stay put. And without bungee, doesn't work. It all falls out. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's just the way it goes. Nice. So what's let's, let's take a if you guys were to watch us walk through with the owner. I mean, you could tell, you know, sometimes you, you watch videos and follow content creators because you can just see their passion. Like, you know, they love it and geek out on you. Like, I want to learn more from that person. If he had a YouTube channel, I'd follow him because the way he talked about it was almost like his baby, like down to the details. Yeah, it yeah, made sure. me want to buy one. I was like, holy cow, where is he? Where is this at? Yeah, this guy right here. Um, it is. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it is. It's it's all I mean, it's his baby for sure. The whole company like it. it, it he treats it that way. You know, I mean, he's I mean almost to a fault man like the guy is involved in everything <laughs> on the website on everything that's posted on everything that's built everything that's done you don't find a lot of owners you can see that the there's the um the graph right there that fish finder right in that slot it's pretty cool i love that is that nine that, inch uh, recess there that's a i think it's a 10 inch that's a 10 inch okay inch, but, but but most of them except for that garmin if they're you know 10 inches they're not going to fit most most nines will fit and then some brands like a hummingbird you got to go all the way down to seven but mm. i mean they fit like they still fit and work in there but not as flush and as nice and clean as most of them but anyway the um but that's james just in a nutshell that's you know james durbecker he's he's meticulous about all this this stuff it's his baby like you said so uh he gets rota molding he came from a rota molding family okay. and he gets it um you know very very well because he you know he grew up with it so um, he's very, very particular about how everything is designed and, and, and how it holds up for you guys when you, when you get them. And look, we don't have, we're not the biggest company. We don't have a giant pro staff. We're not out there just beating, beating the door down with all these anglers out there and all these tournament trails, and, you know, but people who kind of stumble onto us and, and get a crescent they're you know, I've never heard anyone, anyone that's disappointed. They all love it. They all get it. Um, and they love the boat. So I think that's the word of mouth from the consumers is more of our marketing, marketing probably than anything else. And we're proud of that. So, yeah. So Chad, I had Chad Hoover on the show. Actually, this is an unreleased episode. So they're coming out over the next couple uh, weeks, but we were talking about <laughs> the best and worst kayak fishing companies on the market. And what I remember saying about Crescent is it has one of the most loyal consumer followings in the business it does it does and we even have like you know scott future works there he was on there he may still be on i don't know if he's on or not he was on earlier making a comment i mean he's sitting there running the whole the shop and he's you guys may most people i think still remember scott he had a, a podcast for a long time and worked with kbf for a long time as well and just is a figure in the industry you know an icon mm. for a long time and uh and now is with crescent working behind the scenes kind of running things over there so uh, we, we, we have the people, the understanding of what kayak anglers are looking for is speaking of which a lot of what they're looking for 
it's not really about what we're talking about. This series, hardcore, like tournament stuff. It's just, mm. and that's where James, I think that's where he and I kind of came. And it was the perfect fit because he was making these other kayaks. It's a good transition to segue to a light tackle or a CK one or an ultralight, all the other kayaks that are kind of like the, you know, what's good is that because they don't have as many features as the Sholey does, it allows the price point to come it down even further for a quality U S made, made product and it still has yak attack gear tracks they still have all you know you really need to kind of build it up but a lot of folks out there aren't fishing hardcore tournaments they don't need all the bells and whistles so if you click on a light tackle 2 there for example it has you know an, or the ultralight or whatever it's got what all you would need to get you started and get you in at a low price point and then you can build it up with the gear tracks that are there mm. to you know, fit your needs. So it's still like, look at that 1199. I mean, that's, and that's an incredible paddling boat. Comfy seat. Good to go. Yeah. Good to go. High, low seating front hatch. It's even got some of the, some of the features from the, the Sholey on it with the rod stager grooves. And it's got, it comes with a little bag there on, on the side. You can see. Okay. And it's a very, very quick hole. So a great paddling boat. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the cool part is we've not lost sight that, kayak fishing isn't just kayak tournament fishing even though that's what i do and it's very i make very specialized boats kind of for that uh or, or you know for that and other more specialized purposes but the majority of people out there are still just hey i'm i fish a little bit but i also just want to kind of wreck paddle a little bit or i'm not that serious i don't need to spend three thousand dollars or four thousand dollars don't need a pedal drive don't need a motor All right this is a perfect brand like for you yeah well we got cooler lid asking the question ap120 What's next for Crescent Kayak? And this is my question as well. So the Shuley was the first in your specialized kayak. And is there, you know, I don't know if you can share it or not. I know you said right. that sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But I'm like, okay, is a pedal drive coming to Crescent? Because that's something I'd be excited about. But I know you can't right. share things. So I'm not going to put you on the spot. But what you can share, what's next sure. for Crescent Kayak? Yeah, I mean, I'll let you know. I don't. I don't see a, a pedal drive. I mean, sorry to break your heart here, but I don't see a pedal drive in our future for a long time or, or whatever, because it's just not who we are. And we have so many more great paddling kayaks that, to, you know, in our, in, in the works, you know what I mean? It's going to be a long time before we ever, and here's the thing, man, about, it's not just, it sounds great in theory, everyone out there. Oh, I'd love to see a pedal drive, but you got to think there's a business behind this whole thing. Right. And you got to, realize that developing a pedal drive is there's a lot of capital involved in that. Whether, whether you're just going to copy somebody else's drive, which is happening of course, because Hobie's what? patent is up on theirs or, or whatever, or developing your own pedal drive system. There is so much money that goes into that. And you can actually bankrupt your company by trying to do something like that to, to gain, you know, Oh, I want to get into that space. You could actually do the opposite. You could actually hurt your sales and, you know, if it doesn't all work out or something happens, whatever. So it's a huge risk and you don't want to go down that road and take these risks until, you know, for some reason you absolutely had to, you know what I mean? And paddling is again, for the type of folks that Crescent, I think, you know, caters to a lot of wreck kayakers, a lot of wreck slash fishermen, hardcore, even hardcore anglers, especially these, these folks these days with all the tournament trails, except for the Hobie Bass open series, uh, at least all the national tournament trails do allow motors. And then it's kind of like, okay, we've got enough boats for people to put motors on, for people to paddle, you mm -hmm. know, for all the wreck anglers that there's, a, there's just no need to go down that road, you know? So that's kind of yeah, why we're fair. not going there yet. And there's plenty of good companies out there that are doing that. So it's like the pie is just going to, you're just going to kind of try to get a little bit, you know, a teeny little sliver of that pie. And it's, it's a small something. pie. So yeah. you're asking for a small piece of a small pie small piece of a small yeah. piece of pie yeah i get it yeah and it, and it may be and it's definitely popular and it's that, that pie is getting bigger with that stuff but there's a lot of people doing it so like you said yeah you're getting it's just not worth investment and we love we love paddling and it's, there's so many places like rivers and creeks that you just mm. you can't you can't pedal drive anyway and that's never going to change i mean it's never going to change you can't go into thick vegetation with pedal drive so all the places that i usually fish and and do well and win tournaments i'm looking for places i'm knowing know your competition. I'm looking, okay. My competition, I know they, they all have pedal drives and they all have motors. So when I did well and I won the AOI with Hobie and with Bassmaster I had no pedal drive, no motor, no graphs. And I was looking nice. for places that they were not going to go because their pedal drives don't work there. Their motors don't work there. And it let me have those places all 
to myself, if that makes sense. Because if you have a motor, you're going to go to a place where the motor excels. If you have a pedal drive, you're going to do something where that tool is best at. In our yeah. tool, there's still plenty of water. And that's why I got into kayak fishing, because the fish wild and remote places, rivers and creeks, and the paddle will never be topped in those places. I mean, there's certainly mm. sometimes I've been super impressed with what the torpedo can handle and where it can go, especially if you get an innovative sportsman rock guard on that thing and yeah. the, the weed cutter from innovative sportsman on that, on that uh, motor. It is impressive where it can go, but there's still a lot of places it still can't even go. And that's where I'm going to go. And that's where Crescent's going. And uh, of course they work anywhere as well, but yeah. That surely looks sweet. I was up at my local, well, I guess technically your local, since I realized we were just neighbors. Um, yeah. Falls Outdoors. <laughs> yeah, Falls. Um, and they have um, TJ up there. I think he had a surely in her. I got my eyes on it for the first time. I'm like, oh, that thing's pretty. We need well, to go do a hangout there. Well done. I know, right? There you go. You, get, you and I get get some, some pizzas, get some guys up there, get some beers. I mean, come on. Go okay. go have a hangout, everybody, yes. up there and, and, and talk kayak fishing and just just hang out. Yeah. Oh man. So what's new? I, I, we answered the question on whether you're going into pedal and you're, you know, I'm, oh, we're yeah, going to stay, we're gonna stay paddle, but what's, what's happening. This is kind of be the last question since we're a little, well, we're not over time because there's no real time limit to this bad boy, but what is new at, what can we expect from Crescent? Because you, you nailed it with the shoulder, right? That, and there might be another one other kayak that kind of is right. neck and neck for river fishing, but it's good to be the first or second or whatever. Right. Sure. Um, so well done on that. So tip my hat to you guys, but, and Zach asked a question, what's this place? It's falls outdoors, uh, adventure company. It's up yeah. in Cuyahoga falls. Cuyahoga falls. Yep. Yep. They do carry so. Crescent now. Yeah, exactly. That's, yep. that's, it's actually a really cool place. Um, and it just, he just moved into an, a bigger place. Oh, did he? Okay. Was I was in the awesome. old place where the, it was yeah. in the basement, it was really cool. They had live music there. It was just a fun, fun place but that's cool i have to go i still haven't even been there since they carry crescent so i need to get over there there you go and cooler lit asked the question before we kind of finish on your on the last question here he's like where can i demo surely so yeah um i know for instance i'll speak with falls outdoors he over the next year is creating a fleet of demo kayaks where you can come in and take something like a surely uh out for a day like you can rent it for like 50 bucks and you can take it out yeah. on waters and then bring it back. And so it like beats a demo day where you can like hop in it for five minutes, right? You know, it'll pedal mm -hmm. around and come That's back. Right. You can right. actually go out and fish it for a day. Mm -hmm. And so I don't hear of that too often, but Falls Outdoors is is gearing up to do that, which is pretty cool. Um, any thoughts on on that question? Yes, Drew? I would go on crescentkayaks.com, look at the dealer locator, find the nearest crescent dealer. If you're looking to you know demo crescent, call them up and most likely they will have a demo you can check out or know how to get or tell you when their demo day is um most demo days are in you know depending on what part of the country april may june at the latest probably but um they will always i don't know any dealer uh, especially the the crescent dealers the independent mom and pop kind of you know shops that won't find a way to get you to demo the kayak you need you know to, to make sure you're in the right boat so Call them up. The dealer locator is right there. You put in your zip code. It'll show you where the nearest one is. The other thing I will say is the Kayak Adventure Series next year, if you're looking to test out some kayaks next year, we'll have kayak demos at most every tournament stop on our uh, – some some of them on the Thursday opening ceremonies, and the, but definitely on the Saturdays at, at most locations. So that's another chance. And then, yeah, the, the kayak fishing community is awesome. If you get involved and plugged in, uh, most people can find a way to get you – into a kayak and share a kayak just if you need to test one out everyone knows everybody knows who's got what so 100 percent agree with you there and if you're near northeast ohio like reach out to me i'd oh, love yeah. to meet if i'm free and not doing anything you're like hey i want to go check out a kayak up at falls outdoors just let me know if i can if i can meet you i will i love meeting new people so that'd be freaking awesome all right last question for you drew where what can we expect or kind of what's the vision for crescent kayaks because it hasn't been on my radar to be completely right. honest with you, until I started geeking out on it today on the website, watching some videos. <laughs> and now I'm very interested, especially I want to get into more river fishing. I love creek fishing. I typically do it by wading. But the the sholey was like, it, I'm thinking about it. I've been thinking about it all day. And so that's both. really bad. Wade, that's really bad for me. <laughs> float wade with that boat. You can do whatever. Get the strap. <laughs> oh, I know. You, you know, whatever. All right. So what's next? I mean, I will say that, that 
the Sholey was a great first, you know, introduction. Working on something next. I mean, obviously, you know, we've got a, a, a size kayak that I think hit the, the most people fit in that Sholey. Most most people, you know, but we can kind of go up, we can go down from there. We're working on something, uh, and then we got another interesting new product that's coming out. That's it's it's I'll say it's quasi specialized fishing. Um, it's interesting that's coming out pretty soon. Okay. Um, but then the, the next one will be out. I, I mean, I don't know exactly. What's so, pretty soon. You don't say what I is, would say pretty, pretty I would say, I mean, it's this year and in time for you to still get on the water, most likely with it, uh, depending on where you live this, this year. Nice. So it, oh, wow. it really soon. Fun. So, and then the other one will be, uh, next year. So I'll just say next year sometime, <laughs> hopefully earlier, the better we're always shooting for, you know, getting the, getting the season where it's out in time for you guys to be using it. So before, so we're already in August, we're basically in, you know, September. So I'll say before next season, like the spite I spring or late spring next year, you know, between now and then you're probably gonna have two new kayaks from Crescent to mm-hmm. that'll be very fishy. Yes. If that makes sense. Focus. It doesn't. So explain what that means to me. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be ready for you guys. They're going to be good. They're going to be as, as, as cool as, you know, the Sholey and, and, uh, I think okay, like there we it. go. So, yeah. I love it. Well, yeah. tell us where we can find you. Do you have any like passion projects on the side, your YouTube channel? What are the names? Cause I, I noticed today yeah, when I, mean, I was like tagging you, they're not sure. all the same. <laughs> well, I think they aren't, but they're basically, I mean, oh, everything for me is Drew Gregory fishing. You know, YouTube is Drew Gregory fishing, the Facebook page, the Instagram, it's all the same, but the kayak adventure series is obviously, you know, kayak adventure adventure series. Um, but yeah, I mean, you guys can just hit me up any of those social media platforms. Please go follow the Kayak Adventure Series Instagram. We just started it. Uh, Facebook page if you're more of a Facebook person, and um, and YouTube channel. We'll be you know definitely doing more live streams from that channel. But in the meantime, we're going to be using you know the Drew Gregory Fishing Channel and, and other others like Alex Rudd and, and who are by the way Alex Rudd's going to MC with me on stage at the Kayak Adventure Series. So right. that's going to be a trip, and we want to invite you to come to the events because you know where you live where i live basically we are in one of the best locations to hit all of those events like you're saying like they're all you know we have one that's five and a half hours this way four and a half hours this way and then like you know down to georgia's a little bit further but they're actually all we are in the i'd say illinois indiana kentucky ohio like tennessee are probably all in the best position to hit as many of those as possible because yep. you know they're right in the middle from you know, the radius, if you will, from all the events. So go check it out, follow us. And uh, we want to keep the momentum going on that series. Uh, people are excited about it. And then uh, I will say to Brian Slayton, who asked the question earlier real quick, cause I, Great crawler. I saw you. Yes. I did see oh, your, yeah. your uh, question PFDs. Why do I wear the um, foam ones over the inflatables? I do it because it's got all the pockets on it. It helps me. I keep a lot of things in there. I have a, which here's another little tip. If you stay this, this long, I do keep a little, um, not always in my PFD, but um, I do keep a little thermometer, a digital meat thermometer, and I te- check water temperatures with a digital meat th- thermometer when I'm quickly running. Let's say you're at a bridge for a creek or a river, and you're okay. pre-fishing, you're going to all those points I was telling you guys about. And a lot of times, I'm not even unloading my kayak. I'm just driving around and seeing all the, and so I'm checking water temperatures. But anyway, I can keep that in my life jacket. There's just lots of things you can keep in the life jacket. Um that you need that I need handy super glue stuff like that. I like those pockets that plus it's actually a safer style PFD. When you have that right. positive flotation, it is a little safer in case the, the, um, the little mechanism for air doesn't go off and float you. It is I've just seen a it. safer. I've seen um, the videos. It's terrifying when they jump yeah. in and they didn't go off. You're like, Holy crap for that. sure. So I'm just used to it and uh, it doesn't bother me with my casting or anything. So that's yeah. why I use it. I use a, a Stolquist. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, man. So we want to invite you to come to Kayak Adventure Series event. We'll have you there. We're going to have podcasters and YouTubers and influencers heavily involved in those and in a lot of cool ways. I can tell you more about it later. So we want to invite you to, to be a part of it. And uh, if you're interested in even, you know, bringing a mobile setup or something, we we got plans for things like that from podcasters and, and YouTubers nice. and content creators. So, yeah, love to see you there. It's going to be fun. I thought of it all. Well, folks, Drew brought... I mean, there's so many tips in there, not just for the kayak angler. I mean, for the tournament angler, but just for like your home lake. 
right? Have you ever gone into Google Maps Pro and then started mapping all this out and start picking it apart? Um, just so, so many great tips. So thank you so much for sharing with what works for you. Obviously it works for you. For those on a podcast, can't see this, but Drew is swimming in big checks <laughs> right now <laughs> and trophies. And where, did I'm, that, I'm... where did that money go? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> wife and two kids. That's where I guess. That's where so it went. The checks in the, in the, you know, what used to be. Anyway. Uh, impressive. Yeah. Well, Thanks, everybody, man. Drew, thank you. And join us next week. I have all four winners of the Knucklehead Bass Fishing Series on the show where we'll get some insights on how they were able to cons- to catch consistent donkeys. And so that's going to be pretty awesome. They're my teammates, so I look forward to picking that apart myself. I'll see you next Tuesday night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for watching. See you. Nice.